Hello and welcome to the July webinar from the IEA Clean Coal Centre. My name is Stephen Mills and I'm a senior analyst and author at the centre. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports which are available from our website at www.iea-coal.org. After one-off registration, residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download our reports free of charge. Please visit our website for further details. Now today's webinar is based on my latest report, The Prospects for Coal and Clean Coal Technologies in Italy. This discuss, discusses current coal use, its possible importance to the Italian economy in the coming years, and the sort of factors that could influence the level of use we might see. The report's just been published and is now available on our website. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please use the Ask a Question box at the top of your screen. Add your email address as well so that I can send you a fuller answer if we run out of time or if a more detailed response would be appropriate. So to briefly set the scene, well, Italy has a population of around 61 million. It has a market economy that's characterised by a high per capita GDP and a low unemployment rate. Now, according to the World Bank, as you can see here, the country has the 11th largest global economy, it's the second largest manufacturing country in the EU and the fifth largest in the world. And it's the third largest economy in the Eurozone. Now Italy has Europe's second largest industrial sector and this is a major contributor to the country's economy. The government intends that the industrial and manufacturing sectors will maintain a central role in the economy but competitiveness needs to be improved. In recent years economic growth has been relatively poor. Competitiveness, especially in parts that are energy intensive, has been hampered by the high cost of electricity. Average prices are considerably higher, up to 50% in some cases, than the EU average, and inevitably these have an impact on Italian industry. These high prices result from several factors that include a heavy dependence on imported natural gas and oil, plus a reliance on generous incentives for renewables such as wind and solar power. Furthermore, the country has an electricity generating mix that is somewhat different to many competitors elsewhere in Europe and beyond. For instance, as well as gas, Italy also uses more oil for power generation than many other EU countries. In fact, it's one of Europe's biggest oil importers. It also imports electricity from neighbouring countries, and this is an expensive option. There's no nuclear generating capacity. And finally, coal is only used to generate a relatively small part of the country's electricity. In many situations, coal-fired plants generate the cheapest electricity. So, Italy is one of Europe's biggest energy importers. Oil, gas, coal and electricity are all imported in varying amounts. Now, inevitably, this increases costs and raises concerns over security of supply. For instance, much of the country's natural gas comes from Russia at a cost of around 30 billion euros a year via Ukraine. Of course, if this supply was suddenly curtailed, the impact on Italy's industrial and commercial sectors would be dramatic, to say the least. Importing energy is also expensive. We've just mentioned the cost of Russian gas, but overall, in 2011, energy import costs were around 62 billion euros, and by 2012, they were up to 65. So let's take a look at the energy sector. Well, in 2013, total primary energy supply amounted to 159 million tonnes of oil equivalent. Italy gets its energy from a number of sources, in fact, with the exception of nuclear power, all of the usual ones. So in the case of oil, well, although consumption has decreased in recent years, its share in the country's energy mix is still higher than the EU average. Gas, well, natural gas is produced in Italy, although production is limited, so most is imported. Most is used for power generation. In a typical year, gas is used to generate between 40 and 46% of the country's electricity. Renewables. Well, hydro is an important provider, and during the past decade or so, the amount in use has increased significantly. The other renewables of particular note are, as in many other countries, wind and solar power. And in recent years, both have seen big increases. And coal. At the moment, domestic production is minimal, and the bulk of demand is met by imports. Now, compared to many other countries, production from Italian coal mines has never been great. In the 1980s, production, production was somewhere in excess of around 2 million tonnes a year. But this has gradually dwindled and the current level is only around 80,000 tonnes. There's now just a single mine operating, the Carba Sulfus mine in Sardinia's Sulfus Coal Basin. This produces high sulphur-sulbituminous coal. But there's still potential in that region. 
Sulfur's coal reserves have been estimated to lie between 610 and 620 million tonnes, with proven reserves at around 10 million. As we've heard, at the moment, coal plays what can only be described as a modest role in Italy's energy sector, used mainly for power generation. This shows part of the Carba Sulfur's mine, Italy's last working coal mine, now controlled by Sardinia's regional government. Although there are plans for production to be gradually run down, since 2005 there have been various proposals for the site to be revamped as a combined mining and carbon capture site. The regional government is backing one such proposal that would see the construction of a new coal-fired power plant equipped with carbon capture and storage technology. At the moment, the sole customer for the mine's coal is NL's power plant at Port of Esme, where it's blended with imported higher-grade coals. Now, as so little coal is now produced in Italy, and what is produced is of fairly low quality, the country has long resorted to imports to meet most of its coal demand. The vast majority of Italy's coal is now imported. In fact, in a typical year, it imports around 98% of its solid fuel needs. Although there have been some variations over the years, annual consumption has generally fluctuated between about 20 and 27 million tonnes. This is made up of steam coal, mainly for the power sector, as well as coking coal and pulverised injection coal for iron and steel manufacture. But the biggest market by far is the power sector. In, in 2013, 14.6% of Italy's primary energy was provided by coal. The bulk of this, around 90%, was used for power generation. Italy is the lar third largest coal importer in Europe after Germany and the UK. In recent years, major coal suppliers have been the USA, Indonesia, South Africa, Colombia and the Russian Federation. And this, is, this is an example of how the coal arrives. This is Enel's state-of-the-art Torre Nord power plant near Rome. It's Italy's cleanest, most efficient coal-fired power plant. As you can see, it's situated on the coast and fires imported bituminous coal. This is unloaded from Panamax and post-Panamax vessels by means of con continuous ship unloaders. It's then transported through a sealed transport and handling system which uses closed belt conveyors, which ensures that as it's moved, the coal remains in a contained environment. It's taken to two closed dome storage buildings, each of which can hold 150,000 tonnes of coal. They're the largest such structures built in Europe and some of the largest in the world. Now in 2012, amongst the Italian power company, Enel was the biggest taker of imported steam coal at around 13.6 million tonnes. In 2013, the total amount of steam coal imported was around 19. Now let's have a look at the generation sector and its makeup. Well, this relies on a mix of technologies and fuels, but unlike many of the uh, other European countries, there's no nuclear generating capacity and none is planned as this idea was firmly rejected a few years ago in a referendum. But turning our attention to the coal-fired fleet, well, this has a total capacity of around 9.7 gigawatts. Most is based on conventional pulverised coal combustion technology, although several plants use supercritical conditions and there's one major CFBC plant in operation. The inclusion of several supercritical plants helps to push the fleet's overall efficiency up to around 40%, but some are, some are higher. For instance, Torrey Nord, you've mismentioned, regularly achieves around 45% and under some conditions, maybe even a bit more. In recent years, there have been several major coal-fired power plant projects proposed. These comprise both the conversion of old oil-fired capacity to clean coal operation as well as the construction of completely new units. It was anticipated that these plants would achieve similar efficiency levels to Torrey Nord. However, for a number of reasons, these projects now seem unlikely to proceed. As it currently stands, they've either all been deferred or cancelled. Now, the Italian power sector is currently going through some major changes. There are a number of reasons for this, but the main ones are, well, in recent years there's been something of a decrease in demand for electricity. Europe's economic problems have had an impact on industrial and manufacturing activity in general, and this has meant that less electricity has been needed. In addition, there's currently overcapacity in the thermoelectric generation sector, particularly the gas-fired CCGT part. And at the moment, some generators are having a tough time. Now, in the last decade or so, a lot of new gas-fired generating capacity was brought online, in fact, around 20 gigawatts between 2005 and 11. And this, 
coupled with the greater than expected input from renewables, has resulted in the excess capacity in the sector. As we've heard in a previous slide, Italian electricity is more expensive, up to 50%, than the European average. And again, as we've also heard, this high cost results from this combination of factors, all of which help keep the cost of electricity higher than in many other parts of Europe. So we've got some problems of underused capacity at the moment. This situation reflects a number of factors specific to Italy, but also to the wider economic issues that have impacted on the Europe-wide economy. And this was the situation in the last couple of years. As you can see, Italian plants have been producing around 80%, 7% of the country's electricity. New capacity has been added, increasing the country's total by nearly 6 gigawatts to a new total of 124. Some of this new capacity has consisted of renewables, predominantly wind and solar power, and both have continued to grow. In 2012, the combined capacity of the various renewables increased by just over 11%. However, the biggest individual producer of electricity remained the gas-fired sector. This accounted for more than 60% of total thermoelectric production. But as we've mentioned, some CCGT plants are currently operating under severe pressure and there's reduced exploitation of the gas-fired fleet. Some new gas plants haven't yet been brought online and others are operating for only 1,200 to 2,000 hours a year. Most formerly worked for 5,000 to 6,000. Many have seen their hours of operation curtailed as the, and, and the rapid growth of renewables that benefit from dispatching priority has been a major factor in this. Coal-fired plants generated 44.7 terawatt hours, but electricity imports of 43 terawatt hours or around 13% of the total were also needed to meet demand and here the biggest suppliers were France and Switzerland. Overall, Italy is Europe's biggest electricity importer. Now, in 2013, the government produced the National Energy Strategy, or NES. This is part of Italy's attempt to resume sustainable growth by making significant improvements to the competitiveness of its economic system. The NES provides a set of analyses and energy policies and suggests goals and guidelines for future action. However, it does acknowledge that future developments will be taking place within a free market environment, so realistically, it's going to be impossible to centrally control the driving forces. But the intention is that it will influence and improve the energy sector in various ways, making it more effective in boosting economic growth and improving the country's quality of life in general. The overarching goal is the development of a more competitive and sustainable energy sector, and a major aim is to bring Italian energy costs and prices in line with those elsewhere in Europe. Now, assuming that these goals can be attained and these measures are successful, the NES anticipates that, well, electricity demand and consumption will be contained and the country will arrive at an energy mix based mainly on gas and renewables. But within this, coal will continue to have an important role to play, although the level of use will remain roughly the same as the current level. And the use of oil for power generation will effectively come to an end. Now, the NES doesn't pay much attention to the possibility of using more coal to help bring down prices and improve security of energy supply. This seems to be something of a missed opportunity, as there are well-proven advantages that coal can bring to the table, and these are some of them. Clearly, CO2 is currently the main issue, but here there are several possible pathways to minimising this. A prime example is actually in Italy. This is Enel's Torre Nord power plant again. Here, the adoption of high steam conditions and state-of-the-art emission control systems has resulted in power generation that's both clean and efficient. Because of this high efficiency, CO2 emissions per unit of electricity generated are much lower than other, many other plants. In the future, the deployment of CCS systems to coal-fired plants will be important. And as we'll hear later, this is also an area that Italy already has a lot of experience in. But let's get back to the mix of power generation technologies used. It's generally agreed that there are advantages in having a diverse, balanced mix of technologies. And many successful economies around the world have opted for a power sector that's based on a combination of fossil fuels, nuclear power and renewables. And this table is to give you an idea of how it is current energy mix compares with that of a number of important economies elsewhere. There are some notable differences. Italy's reliance on imported oil, and particularly gas, is much higher than the others. And although the NES foresees the use of oil declining, there's no timetable for this. An obvious point is that Italy has no nuclear capacity and that it won't have any for the foreseeable future. 
its reliance on renewables is also the highest of this group. These usually rely on incentives and subsidies to be profitable, and as elsewhere, this has also been the case in Italy. And Italy's coal use is relatively low. For the reasons cited in the previous slide, all of the others rely much more on coal for their electricity. So in the report, I've looked at clean coal technologies in Italy and what's being developed. I've also, um, well, well, I've covered both the um, R&D side, and I've also looked at commercial experience. So on the commercial experience of CCDs, well, let's kick off with supercritical power plants. Supercritical and ultra-supercritical technology is now used in many parts of the world. In fact, in most industrialized countries, it's become the norm for new coal-fired power plants. These are far more efficient than earlier units based on subcritical steam conditions. Supercritical plants are currently operating in around 20 countries, and this includes two major coal-fired plants in Italy belonging to Enel. This is Torre Nord in Brindisi Sud. There's also several oil and gas-fired power plants that use supercritical conditions. Both Torre Nord and Brindisi, Brindisi Sud were both originally far oil-fired but were converted to clean coal firing. There were also several other supercritical coal-based projects planned that for a number of combination of political, legal, economic and environmental reasons are not now going ahead. And here are some examples of Italian supercritical plants. Well, top left is Enel's coal-fired Torre Nord station. This was switched from oil firing and now uses three 660 megawatt supercritical coal-fired units. Top right is the Brinzisi Sud coal-fired plant, otherwise known as Federico II. Again, this was converted from oil firing and now uses four 660 megawatt supercritical units. Bottom left shows the oil-fired Porto Tolle plant. This was the subject of a proposal of conversion to coal firing as well as the host site for a major carbon capture and storage project. And finally, bottom right shows the gas and oil-fired Montalto di Castro power station. So what's been happening on the R&D front? Well, around the world, research into different aspects of supercritical and ultra-supercritical technology continues. Much of this is focused on the development of new materials of construction, capable of withstanding extreme conditions for long periods. Some of this work is being undertaken via international multi-partner programs and projects, and Italy has been involved in a number of these. Related Italian work has also been carried out in the areas shown here. And moving on to fluidized bed combustion, well, a number of Italian generators, universities and research providers have all been involved in FBC-based projects. In fact, some continue to be. But on the commercial front, Italy's only major coal-fired circulating fluidized bed combustion facilities is located at Solstice in Sardinia, where a CFB boiler was used to replace an outdated pulverized coal unit. This was designed to operate on a range of imported and local high sulfur coals. The coal here comes from the carbon solstice mine that we talked about earlier. CFB technology was chosen as being the most adaptable without the need for external FGD or DNOX systems. And the plant normally fires a blend of no more than 20% solstice coal with higher quality imported coal. At the moment, it's Colombian. Elsewhere in Italy, there's also some commercial application of both bubbling and circulating fluidized beds using biomass and waste. Most are small units in burn materials such as RDF, paper sludge or wood. Now co-combustion. Well, this has been the focus of research for a number of Italian organisations such as Enel. In fact, Enel considers biomass to have a significant potential for the reduction of low carbon energy and already operates a number of biomass fired plants spread across Italy and overseas. Enel is also active in the co-combustion of coal with biomass and waste derived fuel in utility scale power plants. There are several projects, but perhaps the two most important ones are, well, the Solstice CFB power plant in Sardinia that we just talked about. Since 2007, this is co-fired biomass with the coal feed. The CFB boiler was supplied by Alstom and modified in such a way as to be able to co-fire three different biomass materials with the coal. The other plant is the Vizina power plant near Venice. Since 2004, this has been co-firing 5% RDF or refuse derived fuel with coal in two 320 megawatt pulverized coal units. The plant is authorized to burn up to 70,000 tons a year of RDF. Now coal firing at up to 5% has had no significant impact on plant operation or emissions, 
and it's anticipated that RDF levels up to 10% should be sustainable. By replacing part of the coal feed with RDF, coal consumption has been reduced by around 40,000 tonnes a year, and usefully, an estimated 55,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions are avoided. Let's have a look at what's happening in the power sector in terms of emissions. Well, the current emission limits for coal-fired power plants depend on factors such as the plant's age and its thermal capacity. However, for existing plants with a rated thermal input equal to or greater than 300 megawatts, these are the current legal limits. Now, during the last decade or so, through a process of heavy investment, emissions of SO2, NOx and particulates coming from the coal-fired sector have been significantly reduced and the country now has a number of power plants in operation that are cleaner and more efficient than many of their counterparts elsewhere. Nine of these have the European Eco Management and Audit Scheme certification. This equates to around 9.5 gigawatts of installed generating capacity, or about 85% of Italy's coal-fired plants. The result of this investment in modern control, emission control systems is significantly reduced the levels of plastic pollutants emitted. So as you can see from this figure, for some years, Emissions of both NOx and SO2 have fallen steadily. In fact, between these dates, SO2 levels fell by 89% and NOx by 54 Now, over the past decade or so, generators have instigated emission reduction programs and systematically improved control systems. In the case of NL, they've reduced emissions by the means shown here. As you can see, these moves have had a dramatic effect with large reductions in NOx, SO2 and particulate emissions, other generators have managed to, to, to also reduce levels to, by similar amounts. Now clearly when a coal-fired power plant is in operation it generates a number of solid residues. Much of this comprises fly ash and bottom ash produced at the combustion stage and if the plant is fitted with an FGD unit to control SO2 emissions there is also going to be gypsum produced. Within Europe as a whole around 60 million tonnes a year of coal, of coal combustion residues are generated. The bulk of this comprises fly ash, around two-thirds, with bottom ash making up 10% and FGD residues a further 18%. Now, because of the increasing limitations on landfilling, there is now a greater focus on utilising these materials rather than simply dumping them. In Italy in 2012, the total amount of ash generated by coal-fired power plants came to around 1.68 million tonnes. Of this, around 1.4 was recycled in various ways. This was used mainly for construction products, cements and concrete mixtures. Much of the ash from NL's plants and other Italian generators is used, so overall there's a high degree of fly ash utilisation within Italy. Some is even exported to overseas markets, mostly to the concrete and cement industries in the UK and Belgium. The other solid residue produced in significant quantities is gypsum from FGD operations. Italian plants generate around 45,000 tonnes a year of this, and of this total around 36,000 tonnes is utilised mostly for warboard manufacture. Now moving on to gasification. Well, historically, a lot of Italian gasification-based research is focused on the use of coal from the Solstice Basin. And over the past two decades, a number of different coal fuel projects have been proposed for the area. Probably Italy's most important gasification test facility is that of Soto Carbo, built in the Solstice region between 2007 and 8. This incorporates two fixed-bed updraft air-blown pilot and demo-scale gasifiers, both of which are equipped with a range of syngas clean-up systems. These have been used for some important studies and to date have operated for more than 2,500 hours. Interest in the possibilities of gasifying low-quality solstice coal remains ongoing. Most recently, Soto Carbo and the Hungarian coal producer have combined forces to investigate the use of solstice coal, solstice coal and Hungarian brown coal for power generation and the production of heat and clean gaseous and liquid fuels. Much of this work has been carried out using the Soto Carbo test facility. Now initially there are a number of gasification plants operating commercially, although none currently uses coal. At the lower end of the capacity spectrum are small air blown units using pelletized RDF in biomass. And of course at the other end there are four large IGCC plants that operate as part of major oil refiners where they gasify various resi refinery residue streams to generate electricity and then to produce steam and hydrogen for on-site operations. Which brings us to carbon capture and storage. Well, earlier we talked about some of the advantages that coal can provide, especially when it comes to power generation and the importance of clean coal technologies. 
These will be important in securing a continuing future for coal, an energy source that is vital to many developed and developing economies around the world. In some cases, coal is the only bulk source of energy available, and many growing populations depend heavily on the power it provides. Now, although there can be obvious problems associated with unabated coal use, through the use of CCTs, these can now be controlled and emission levels reduced dramatically. At the moment, the big issue is clearly CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use. In this respect, in the future, carbon capture and storage will have an increasingly important role to play. But costs need to come down and energy penalties reduced. And there's a lot of useful work going on around the world focused on these issues, some of it in Italy and involving Italian researchers. In Italy, the main drivers of developing CCS are focused on sustainable development coupled with the sustainable use of fossil fuels. CCS forms part of the latter and is considered to be an important factor in the eventual transition to a decarbonised society. The Italian National Energy Strategy that we heard about earlier acknowledges the importance of CCS, referring to it as a research priority. It also notes that CCS systems currently carry high financial and energy penalties, but agrees that in the longer term, the technology is likely to have an important role to play. CCS development is viewed as an opportunity for Italian industry, but also for the energy system and technology suppliers, as potentially suitable systems could be applied to coal, oil and gas fired power plants. Now, clearly we don't have time to go through everything that's been achieved or wound away, so I'll just touch on a few of the more significant developments. CCS is discussed, discussed at some length in the report. The three main approaches to CO2 capture have been or are being addressed by different Italian organisations. In each, they've already carried out important work and helped move the various technologies forward. So, in the case of post-combustion capture, one of the more important projects was the Zero Emission Portatolli project in Brindisi. This covered the design and construction of a demonstration CCS plant as well as detailed site characterisation needed to confirm the feasibility of CO2 injection and storage. The main aim was the conversion of old oil-fired generating capacity to clean coal plus CCS operation. However, government approval for the project was subsequently reversed and the project's final stage is cancelled. Although it failed to reach its full hopeful potential, a considerable body of useful information was amassed, much of which is being put to good use today. Now, moving on to pre-combustion capture, well, here a prime example was NL's cooperation with the Spanish company Endesa where the two collaborated on coal gasification and CO2 capture at Endesa's IGCC plant at Puerto Lano in Spain. Enel then focused on systems for generating power using hydrogen produced during the separation process. And out of this came the, the, the 16 megawatt hydrogen fueled Fusina power plant project near Venice, the world's first. And lastly, we come to oxyfuel combustion. This technology is viewed as having significant potential and some groundbreaking work has been carried out in Italy. I'll have to limit myself to mention a few selected aspects of this, but once again the topic is covered in some detail in the report. So let's begin by looking at the interesting isotherm technology. Now, building on earlier work in 2004, ITEA introduced a novel concept called flameless pressurised oxycombustion. This uses high temperature oxygen enriched air in pressurisation to create a flameless oxycombustion reaction that produces a CO2 rich capture ready gas stream. The associated energy penalty is lower than competing capture systems. Initial testing was carried out in ITEA's 5 megawatt facility shown here on the left. I won't go into the details of how the system works, suffice it to say it shows a lot of potential and experience suggests that commercial scale plants will be fuel flexible, readily automated easy to operate and compact. It was announced recently that a US-based company was collaborating with ITEA with a view to building pilot into commercial scale plants in the USA. Now, oxycombustion is also part of the work program of the newly formed CO2 Technology Center, SOLSIS, based at Soto Carbo's research center in Carbonia. Here, a 10-year R&D program on advanced coal-fired processes and CCS is underway. This started in January 2014 and covers five main areas, namely pre- and post-combustion capture, coal to liquids, power generation using biomass with CO2 capture, and CO2 storage. Part of the centre's work involves the development of a 48 megawatt thermal pressurised oxy combustion pilot plant and an associated test programme. 
This is expected to be completed in 2017 and to be followed by a large-scale demonstration on a coal-fired power plant. The pilot plant will be used to test different coals, provide operating experience and allow the optimization of industrial scale combustors. This schematic shows part of the large pilot engineering package developed for the centre. And finally, under the terms of the Italian law of February 2014, a new 350 megawatt demonstration project based on pressurized oxybook combustion technology is to be built in the Solstice area. This is expected to capture between 1 and 2 million tonnes a year of CO2 that will be stored in deep aquifers or coal seams in the, coal, in the Solstice basin. An international competition will select the technology provider for the new plant within the next year. So, just to wrap things up, well, Italy is an important economy and a major European industrial player. The industrial sector remains the, dri the main driver of the economy, but electricity prices are high and this hurts its economic competitiveness. In part, this results, results from an energy mix that depends heavily on imported gas and highly incentivized renewal. Furthermore, as it lacks nuclear power and coal makes only a modest contribution, this is significantly different to the year average EU mix. Italy is one of Europe's biggest energy importers, importing much of its oil, gas and coal, as well as some electricity. This increases the country's vulnerability in terms of security of supply. In recent years, this has been threatened on a number of occasions. It's also very expensive. A national energy strategy has been published with the aim of achieving a more secure, less expensive and environmentally sustainable energy supply. A major priority is to reduce the cost of the country's electricity but most focus is on gas and renewables, and both options seem to keep, seem likely to keep the electricity prices high. Coal doesn't get a mention, nor the well-documented advantages that it can bring. Apart from further increases in renewables, the current energy mix may not change significantly for some time. In the period up to 2030, Italy is likely to remain heavily dependent on fossil fuels, with much of the energy requirement being met by imports. Unfortunately, recent years have seen the cancellation of several important proposed major clean coal-based power projects. These would have operated cleanly and efficiently and provided secure, low-cost electricity. Italy already has a proven track record in the development of very clean and efficient coal-fired power plants. And finally, various CCTs are already being used or under active development in Italy, and these are some of the areas being addressed. That brings us to the end of my presentation. Uh, today's presentation will be available to download from the webinar page of our website later on today. Now let's see if any questions are coming during the course of this. Just bear with me for a moment. Yes, we have a couple here. Uh, you mentioned that several major clean coal fire projects have been cancelled. Can you tell us a bit more about these and what their potential might have been? Uh, well, there were three big projects proposed that were to have been based around the conversion of old ore fired plants to clean coal operation. We, we've heard something about that today. If those three had gone ahead, somewhere between four and five gigawatts of new coal fired capacity would have been added to the Italian grid. Um, coal share in the energy mix as a result would have gone up from probably 12% to something like 16 or 17%. The, um, the three large oil conversions were to have been based at um, Enel's plant at Porto Tolle, which we saw during the, the presentation. Uh, it was also the Val Vabo Liguri plant at Torino Power, and there was also to be a project in Calabria known as the Salin Jonis project. There were also a couple of smaller ones that proposed that also failed to materialise. They all appear to have founded through a combination of some local opposition coupled with mainly with environmental and legal challenges. All have either now been cancelled or at least deferred. None seem very likely to proceed, at least not in the foreseeable future. But of course, that situation could always change. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, you commented that in recent years, Italian power companies had reduced emissions from their coal plants. What sort of measures did they take to achieve this? Um, I, I suppose probably the best way to address this might be to look at what Enel did, the biggest biggest generator in Italy. T to tackle their SO2 emissions, they, they, they followed a well-trodden path and concentrated mainly on retrofitting FGD units to appropriate power plants. Um, 
with Knox, again, they relied on well-proven technologies that, depending on the individual circumstances, included adopting primary measures, switching to low NOx burners and fitting SCR systems or combinations of the three. Uh, particulates have been re produced mainly through a program of gradually replacing electrostatic precipitators with fabric filters. Um, this has been part of NL's uh, uh, ongoing project. Um, in fact, the, the Italian company Termochimic carried out a lot of these ESP to fabric filter conversions for NL. Um, in terms of particulate emissions, this system is now regarded as one of the cleanest in the world. Um, in fact, in NL's case, these, these, these moves have had a big impact. So in the last decade or so, SO2 emissions have gone down by, I think, 96%. NOx was reduced by over 90%, and I think particulates by about 98%. However, that's not necessarily the end of the story, as NL is continuing to work on getting its emissions down further. Um, other, other generators have followed similar routes to cutting emissions as well. And I think we have one more... One more question here. Um, a lot of work seems to have been carried out on CCS in Italy. Where's the funding come from? Um, well, for about the, the last 15 years or so, there's been a national CCS R&D program in place. Uh, this has been part of uh, parts of national and international CCS re research activities, and Italian utilities, um, universities, and research providers have all been looking into CO2 capture and storage. Um, Fundings come from several of the EU framework programs, in fact, five, six, and seven, as, as well as from Italian industry and a number of Italian ministries, such as the Ministry of Education, University of Research, and the Ministry of Econ Economic Development. It, it, it's surprising just how many major multi-partner EU projects Italy's been involved in. So they've been involved in, for instance, CASPA, Inca CO2, uh, Geo Capacity, CO2, GeoNet, and, and, and so on. So there were actually quite a lot um, and indeed they are they, they remain active in some of these now right I think that seems to be the last question just give me a second I'll just make sure <laughs> yeah I think that's it there don't seem to be any more questions coming in at the moment well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I will just tell you when the next, if you bear with me just a second, I'll tell you when the next uh, webinar will be. This will be given by Dr. Ian Barnes next month, our, July, our August one. And he, Ian will be talking about uh, work he's been recently carrying out on the use of low quality fuels in, in, in circulating fertilised bed combustors. Once again, many thanks for your, your attention. If you have any more questions to send in, please add your email and I'll see if I can address them. So, thank you very much and, and goodbye.